Hi everyone, just before we get this next history hack outing going, we would just like to extend the most incredible thanks to everybody for the support you've given us so far. The podcast has just passed 1 million downloads, which has completely blown our minds. So from Alex, Zach, myself, all the guys down the pub, we just want to say thank you so much. And to keep doing what you're doing, spread the word, tell your friends, like, subscribe, review. Remember, there's a Patreon, it's got its own Discord channel now where there's chat and things on it. There's Ko-Fi for dropping us a tip for an episode you'd like. There's the bookshop where all the latest books from our great guests are. And of course, just tell everybody about us because the next million downloads we hope will come a lot quicker. And who knows what is going to come up in the next year. So thank you once again. I'm going to stop waffling. Here's the show. Hello and welcome to History Hacks, dedicated Second World War and a bit either side aviation podcast, head chopping with me, Matt Bone. We've been off for a while, so I thought we'd come back and we'd have a bit of fun with this one. So I've, I've asked a couple of mates to join me and we're going to just sort of put the world to rights, really, for a little while. Talk about planes, talk about what's coming up on the, over the summer, general bits and pieces and see what they've both been up to, because we've had them both on the show before. I'm delighted to be welcomed, or welcoming even, Adam Berry and Matt Willis back to the show. So Adam, you remember we had on with um, Seb and we talked about how the uh, Ninth Troop Carrier Command were fantastic and everything that's been said about the worst trained pilots dropping the best trained soldiers was complete pants, which was good fun. And then we had Matt Willis, who brought us all up to speed with Allison Engine Mustangs. And I am a complete convert to the fact that they're the business now. So we'll start with Adam. How are you doing, sir? It's been a while. I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, I'm very well. How are you? I'm good. Well, I say it's a while. We were at the Grand Prix together last year. We were so at the Grand seen Prix each other since, that, since then. But... <laughs> that was a while ago now. Um, yeah. it's, near, well, it's nearly a year ago now. So uh, getting getting close to a year ago now. Yeah, it's scary how time flies. Mad. Mm. And Matt, it's been even longer, but how are you keeping, mm. sir? Yeah, not bad. Um, tired, post-viral fatigue and stuff, and uh, lots of deadlines. But um, apart from that, uh, plugging away. was in the Lake District recently, so, uh, you know, always anything's helped by going up a mountain, so that's nice. Very good. Now, how's the dog? Yeah, the dog's good. He's got two speeds, full and stop, so that's fun. He's, he's going racing at the weekend, so that'll be nice. Fantastic. I, I'm keen for this one because you guys have been really busy because you know, Matt seems to be, every week you've got an article out. Adam, you've got volume two of your magnum opus due shortly, and it's sort of volume two and a half, isn't it? Because you've you got extra bits on it. Yeah. Let's, let's start with you, Adam. How has volume two come? Tell us about it. When do we get to see it? And it will remind me to go away and buy volume one. Uh, when do you get to see it? That is, that you know, that's the sort of how long's a piece of string cut type question, because I have been a little bit lapse on my side of working on that book because, um, as I'm sure you're aware, Matt, me and Sophie were having an extension at home, and I lost my office for a while. So having somewhere comfortable to work on the book has been difficult. But uh, luckily for me, I'll, obviously, but we. So I, I co-author the book with a, a Dutch guy called Hans, who is, in my opinion, just about as knowledgeable as a, a, an individual can be on um, on, a, on a specific subject, which is troop carrier operations, particularly during their market garden. So he's been doing an awful lot of legwork on it. He's been essentially putting together the chapters, but because he is Dutch, and although his, his English is, is very, very good, it, it takes me going in and you know reworking the chapters adding bits in there that make it more readable for somebody that's not necessarily into you know the the, the nitty-gritty details of the history of nine troop carrier command things like quotes and veteran testimonies and things like that that bring the story to life a little bit and uh, and ultimately editing the book into something that can be published the the difficulty we had with volume one was that we got we got so many photos from veterans' families, from veterans, from the archives, 70, 75% of which had never been published before, that we, we had a very hard time 
picking and choosing what photos went into the book. And there are a lot of photos actually that we, we took out of the book that in, in an ideal scenario we would have left in. With volume two, we've got that problem, but worse, essentially. We've got such an incredible collection, talking in the region of maybe two, two and a half thousand images that were taken of, so volume two will be 53rd Troop Carrier Wing. So for anyone who lives down in the sort of Wiltshire, Berkshire area, they were all based around that area of, uh, of England. And picking it again, picking and choosing what content we put in there is proving very difficult. So as you alluded to, it could potentially end up being two books sold as one um, because we don't want to detract from the quality of uh, the context, uh, content of the book by, you know, chopping bits out. We want to be able to, you know, really showcase what these guys did. We're working on that at the moment. I say, you know, we don't really know when it'll come out. We really want it to be this year, um, but there's a lot of work to do. In the meantime, I've been working on a, on a then and now book of uh, Troop Carrier Command in the UK, which, again, I've been working on with hands to try and bring in some of the photos that were excluded from Volume 1 and some of the photos that will be excluded from Volume 2 of these guys out on furlough in the UK, London, Nottingham, uh, Newbury, Reading, all these sorts of places. Uh, and as a then and now book does, showing comparison th photographs of what the places look like now, and they seem to be, theme-wise, quite popular books. So we thought, you know, why not? We'll have a bit of fun with that whilst we're working on the um, on volume two because it's, there's a, bit, a little bit more of a relaxed process behind, uh, you know, putting that sort of book together. And plus, I, I find it very fun falling down a very, very deep rabbit hole of trying to figure out where certain photographs were taken by traipsing around the country on essentially Google Street View until we find the right spot, which is often successful, often not, but it's been, it's been fun nonetheless. Oh, that sounds really good. Looking forward to that. Another thing to nag you about for when, when you're going to give me an update <laughs> for it. But Matt, I, goodness, what haven't you been doing? It seems <laughs> you've, you've, you've been terribly busy. Swordfish books due. The Mustang yep. books getting reprinted in a couple months. Yep. And as as we've all now received our copies of Aeroplane for next month, you've done the most incredible database at the back of it for sort of British aviation from 1952 to now. So pick one, sell it. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, okay. Well, um, I, I mean, I ought to sell the, the Swordfish book because that's the one that, that will have royalties. But, you know, the aeroplane one, I, I think the, uh, I'm actually really quite proud of that. I'm generally happy with, with everything I do for aeroplane. I'm quite, quite lucky to, to be able to do quite a lot of stuff for them this year. But the database was um, Ben Dunnell um, sort of came to me with the idea of saying, we'll do something a little bit, uh, little bit uh, different for the database for this month because this issue is the the platinum jubilee issue um and that's kind of the main theme for those who are not familiar with with aeroplane the database is usually a feature or a series of features on a single uh, aircraft type so um a potted history of the the aircraft type but not that potted because you know usually you're talking about uh, sort of say Eight eight thousand words uh, around about that on uh, on the entire history of a particular aircraft type. But Ben came came to me and said uh, we'd like to do something on the the whole British aviation industry from 1952 to the present. And and being a naive idiot, I said uh, yeah, that sounds interesting. Um, and you know it was a hell of a lot of work, as you'd imagine. Different kind of style of work to usual because it's it's quite broad, but necessarily has to be quite shallow because you have to to cover a hell of a lot. And it was really interesting actually being able to take that step back and look at things from a broader perspective than you would normally be able to, and actually start sort of looking at the whole story and and stories within the main story and following threads through. So you know things like air-to-air -air missiles from the from the from the outset and uh you know the 
the development of rotorcraft and um, airliners and all the sort of, you know, because the usual thing is, I think the thing that, to, to sort of sum, sum it up, if it's possible to do so, the view that a lot of people have is, is basically one of decline and that it started out in the 50s when, you know, Britain was a great aircraft aviation nation, able to compete with anyone in the world. And we were doing everything. We were doing everything from, you know, military aircraft, airliners, uh, rotorcraft. There wasn't anything we didn't do. We did it all ourselves. And then after that, there was, you know, horrible governments that cancel things and, you know, could have things that could have been world beaters <coughs> or two. And then were, were you know, <laughs> terribly short-sightedly killed by appalling politicians and stuff like that and the view i think i came to was that it's a lot more complicated than that it, it's there are areas of withdrawal from certain areas of the the industry and areas that we've kind of got out of as a country that that maybe we didn't need to and, didn't, and shouldn't have done but on the other hand some of the sort of technology that's that's now coming through and the way the United Kingdom fits into other projects it, it's really kind of top of the top of the game and it, it's sort of specialization and and development and evolution in certain through certain paths and you know UK has taken one path and countries like France and so on have taken different ones and I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with that so yeah it was an interesting an interesting process kind of trying to, to step back and put all of that together so that's in the June issue of of Aeroplane magazine and it's yeah, it's great. There's some great, you get the rotor died in there, which is always always good to, to squeeze into any any discussion. Mm. Sure. You kindly sent us it yesterday. We both, Adam and I, had a little little flick through. It is when you say comprehensive, yeah, it's it, it's a it's a big old read. So I haven't it had is. the time to sit down with mm. a cup of tea yet. But I've picked out a few bits. You've got you know fire streaks on javelins in there. Mm. Um, the the bit that I'm if you can hear me clicking in the background, it's because I'm trying to find it, and it's. What, 23 <laughs> 25 pages of of yeah. good content just, people there's about 12 i think there's probably about about sort of it's probably more than twelve thousand words actually it's a good it's a good old chunk of text and lots of pictures which obviously you know aeroplanes got such a great archive and they're able to source photos from from uh, from everywhere else as well so it's you know it's really well illustrated as they they always do in, in my, uh, you know, not entirely unbiased view, but, but yeah, you know, it's a kind of, it's a good one to keep. I think I hope it will be a half decent reference for people in the, in the future as well. Cause it's, uh, it doesn't miss much out. I don't think, despite obviously being a, it's not a full book by any stretch of the imagination, but you know, we covered a lot of ground. It's, de it's definitely a keeper, you know, often yeah. with these magazines, you find that sort of a little bit, uh, you know, once you've read them, You've read them, but this one's definitely a keeper. Mm, I'm glad to hear that. It, yeah, it is. I subscribe to it because I like it, and that's not, that's not just because yeah, they got me to write something from. But um, mm -hmm. it's um, yeah, no, it's 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 a superb. I'm going to enjoy delving into that a little bit more because you you also had that excellent one about the um, dear old Mister Gray and his slagging off of the Soviet long distance attempt last month. Which was, yeah. Uh, um, well, that was, I mean, that that one kind of started with when they did the anniversary piece for Aeroplane, which I now can't remember whether that was last year or the year before, um, but it was, Ben again asked me to do a piece on on C.G. Gray and his politics, which um, I think, you know, I'm quite grateful to Ben for having the faith in me to tackle that uh, that very sensitive subject. Um, but to one be, of the to, be, that... to be fair, you'd think the editor of Aeroplane would step up to write an article about the editor of airplane wouldn't you but, well you know they they they, they uh they, this was a it was a it was a piece within a piece so it was the um again the, the database that month was was on the history of of airplane magazine and, and arthur ord hume uh, was doing it he was you know i can't think of anyone better to do the overall piece but one of the bits that you know i didn't really touch on in the end because there was more of it in the main article was this whole business of of Gray challenging the legitimacy of the, uh, the the long distance record that the Russians had made in uh, in the Tupolev Ant twenty five aircraft, which involved the sort of transpolar flights, which were quite sort of dramatic flights at the time, where you know nobody had had made these flights directly over the pole, which is obviously now a commonly used route um, across continents. But uh, this was sort of pioneering stuff. For that reason and for the, the record setting. And they went to Gray and, and he had his team go to some quite 
extreme lengths to to prove to prove that this um, couldn't be possible. And that, you know they they looked at the mathematics and they had papers from the um, National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics in the states. You know which were all kind of enlisted in the service of of proving that these aircraft weren't capable of of making the flights. And I so I kind of thought well, you yeah, know that's kind of been left hanging because. The, um, the FAI at the time decided that the records were, were legit. The various other countries were kind of, you know, pretty much recognised them straight away. But a lot of that, I think, was on the fact that, as, as Gray pointed out, you know, quite a lot of it is done on trust and that it, it requires, like, the, the main aero club of the country concerned to, um, to do certain things to validate the record. And there was a question of whether you could trust a, what was essentially an authoritarian regime to be trustworthy over these things. But of course, you know, Gray didn't mind at all when it was Nazi Germany or fascist Italy that was um, carrying out uh, record flights because he had some, um, frankly, his views were uh, you know, offbeat even by the standards of the time. And, you know, he had some really out there views, uh, which, you know, makes him quite controversial as a figure because he's so important to the foundation of the aviation media in the UK uh, and really and the the, the the establishment of aviation generally you know in the early days he was he was really quite uh, influential but he was a frightful bigot and uh, he had some hideous views and I think it's it's actually sort of you know it's quite good that the aeroplane is you know they're not trying to hide that they're, they're actually engaging with that uh, as a subject and I think that's uh, because, you know, the magazine was always political when Gray was in charge and he made it that way. People say, take the politics out of aviation history and stuff. It's like, well, sorry, you know, can't do that. So, you know, we're trying to do that in a kind of sensitive and balanced way. And, uh, you know, it's interesting to be able to explore things in that way rather than just, you know, nuts and bolts and um, top trumps. And, and anything on Gray's cat dip to me because he's, hmm. <laughs> he's, he's... He's such a weirdo. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, that's... Uh... That, that's that's a whole other show but um and of course swordfishes which you're yeah. you know, bo bo boaty kind of boaty planes which mm, mm. we try to stay away from that's that that one's been a little while in the coming now hasn't it yeah it has it was it was due to come out god when was it it was basically uh delayed by the first lockdown because the the publisher tempest books anticipated that there would be um rightly so that there will be sort of you know logistical issues with that so so that and another book that i'm working on um got uh, they they made the decision early to to put those back and then obviously they got and then they got into a queue with other stuff that i was working on and and that the publisher was working on so uh so that has been a little bit of time but uh, i'm expecting that by the end of the month and actually, it was lucky. It was good to have the delay because it enabled me to um, to include stuff that I wouldn't have been able to otherwise, uh, not least interview materials with what must have been one of the last surviving operational swordfish air crew, uh, an observer by the name of um, Brian Riley, who's who's sadly no longer with us. Um, but I was able to, to, you know, probably got about sort of maybe 12 or 14 hours of interview material with him, a tiny fraction of that, which makes it into the swordfish book because he was on Mac ships. And, you know, it's really interesting career that, that he was uh, he was on Mac ships in the Atlantic and then switched to was kind of suddenly switched to Avengers and then ended up in uh, in the Pacific in an Avenger. So I'm not sure how many people fought in both the Battle of the, Atl the Battle of the Atlantic and in the, uh, the, the, the Pacific War as well. So, yeah, and, and, you know, he was he was in the thick of the, uh, the Sakashima Gunto raids so uh, yeah i managed to, to get some uh, some some additional material from him and it's also the first book in which i i do the artwork as well as the text and sourcing all the photographs and things like that so the uh, the profile artwork there'll be 16 um 16 profiles uh done by myself so i'll be interested to see how people receive those because i haven't uh, haven't had any examples of that that kind of work published yet fantastic so yeah, goodness, you have been a busy boy, haven't you? <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> let's get on to let's get on to the summer because it's it's our first summer in a couple of years where stuff is properly happening. And um, we, we were chatting about this a little bit before. We're sort of knocking around with you know, projects that are that are going on, air shows, and of course we've got some interesting looking films coming out. But I thought. Adam, let's, let's start with you. What's sort of top of your hit list besides 
returning to Silverstone for reasons that I will not be joining you for this year, but uh, I'm sure it'll be fantastic. <laughs> um, I mean, obviously, I'd love to get back to their shows. I missed them tremendously last year, uh, last year, and was it the year before we didn't have any as well? Obviously, very gutted about the situation with uh, Flying Legends because, you know, Flying Legends is what it is. It's uh, for those of us that are into the uh, older style of aircraft, then it's, you know, one of the go-to air shows. So it's disappointing to see that there's not been, that, that plans put in place, I, I, I believe, to move it to Sidewell sort of seem to have fallen down. Other than that, I'm, um, I'm, I'm air show wise, I'm sort of keeping my eyes open. I mean, the victory show is going ahead again, which is local to me. And that is usually a pretty good show for flying. I don't know the ins and outs of it really, but I get the impression that some of the limitations that get put on aircraft at air shows don't necessarily apply to, um, to the, uh, to the victory show. Um, obviously they're not allowed to fly with a flight line, but you get up close and personal with the aircraft. You see them landing on a grass strip, which is, uh, you know, nice and close, which is not very often you get to, to see second world war aircraft landing on a grass strip. Um, it certainly makes for good photographs. So I'm looking forward to that, but otherwise, yeah, I mean, I'll keep my, my sort of, you know, ear open to, um, to what, what, what's going on. And, uh, if I'm around, I'll, um, I'll try and make way to whatever I can. Yeah, I've, I've not got anything booked up myself yet. So I'm hoping to pop up to Shuttleworth for a couple because they, they always they always put a good show as well. Matt, are you if you got anything lined up? Are you? Yeah, I'm due to. Well, I'm I'm um, due to go to Riyadh, uh, which I haven't been to for you know a good few years. And obviously, that's not been on for for a couple of years. So it's uh, be interesting to see what they do manage to uh, um, to get together for that. You know, disappointing that uh, Yeovilton Air Day is not happening this year for, I think, for financial reasons, they've said, which, you know, is, is not uh, not terribly surprising, but it is, it, it's a pity because I've, I've been, um, a last, to the last couple of examples of that, I was actually there with the, with the Ferry Barracuda restoration um, team rather than as a spectator, but it's, it's, you know, it was good to go to anyway. Always a great static display there as well, and um, so it's a, it's a shame. Hopefully, that will be back next year. See, with the you know loss of Caldros in the last uh, little while as well, that's uh, you know a uh, shame to not have the Ovalton this year. But yeah, React um, should be interesting. Other than that, I'm again not really booked in for much this year, but hoping to. Um, I've done one of the um, Threshold Aero photo shoots, which was, I've done more of them than air shows in the last uh, the last few years, actually. A, a sort of, you know, although there's no actual flying, it, it's actually a good and different way to get sort of, you know, up close to operating aircraft and, you know, get interesting things thrown in with reenactors and things like that. So, uh, you know, there was some, uh, you know, lovely to see the new, uh, the newly restored Max Holst, Max Holst Broussard at... Uh, uh, Oaksy Park recently which uh, hoping to see that on the display circuit this this season as well that's a lovely aeroplane and quite a quite a rarity so uh, nice to see that kind of spitting blue exhaust flames in the uh, um, you know behind in front of a starry sky so uh, yeah I love that kind of thing. Fantastic. Let's get on to projects you've mentioned the Barracuda but I'm gonna go to Adam because there's one project we've been watching that they've starting to kit kit things out in a in a big way with with charlie's night fright aren't they yeah i was going to mention actually um a minute ago that obviously that's probably fingers crossed i spoke to charlie recently about where they stand with the project and you know it, it feels like there's been sort of stops and starts with it but he's hopeful that they'll get it in the air this year so that's that's huge because as you know it's uh you know, okay, there's there's plenty of C-47s that are airworthy. There's plenty of C-47s that are airworthy with, with a great history behind them. But the project in general with uh, with Charlie and, and the team that are restoring Night Fright, the, 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 the details that they are going, the lengths they're going to, to make it potentially the, the most original C-47 flying, it, it's mind-blowing. I mean, aside from the... The instruments that they're sort of legally obliged to put in the cockpit they are it's it's going to be about as original as they come really um i know they're having issues with obtaining the correct floor but <laughs> <laughs> which seems which to the 
you know, to anyone who doesn't really really care, it doesn't seem like a great a great deal. But there was a difference between the type of floor that the Night Fright would have had and the type of floor that's sort of readily available from a lot of the, the post war modded C forty sevens, and and they want the real floor, which is commendable. They want it to be um, as original as possible, and of course, the fact that it will fly out of memory as well. It's wartime home is incredibly unique. A conversation with a number of people, and I can't really think of another warbird that 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 does that or will, you know, is in a position to fly out of the airfield it flew from operationally during World War Two. And having seen the plans they've got in place for what they want to do with memory, you know, with the museum, um, I don't want to say too much, but I know that Charlie's looking at another aircraft as well. Hopefully, it'll be it'll be kind of a bit like an East Kirkby, but for um, but for, for troop carrier, for troop carrier stuff, which would which would be great. Hopefully, it'll be a little bit like uh, stepping back in time. You know, fingers crossed they can get it in the air this year, and um, and hopefully I'll get to have a little ride on it. That'd be great. Yeah, he, he did mention that to me as well. So I need to I need to touch base <laughs> with him today. Does, doesn't yeah doesn't forget? It's just all these little gentle reminders every now and then. But uh, he did actually say that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, just to make I think sure I have him. Yeah. I think I haven't recorded saying it as well, which I didn't use <laughs> oh, well. in the podcast. So I'm, I'm going to hold that against him. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, ex- it's exciting stuff. And, and Matt, the Barracuda Project have been posting mm. some really, really cool things recently. Have you been speaking to them? Well, I guess you would have been, wouldn't you? But how, how are they getting on? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're doing well. I mean, it's it's um, obviously slow going because of the nature of the, um, the, the project. Uh, and obviously covid it hit them like it hit everyone else but you know they've been getting back into it and you know working on it piece by piece and it's only a small team working on it but they're dedicated and they're doing you know they have the their weekly updates on facebook which are um you know a a, a reason one reason not to delete facebook and although to be honest you can look at the updates even if you're not uh even if you don't have an account, I think. But, you know, it, it's the level of detail they're working to is just absolutely fabulous. And the the way they're able to take these kind of, you know, bent and corroded and totally messed up original components and and create out of them something that, that is incredibly original and yet looks pretty much like new. And doing this, at, you know, at the level of an individual component, it's, it's you know, inches across and so you know it'll be a long time before we see something that looks like a an airplane but it, it is uh coming together and i think they made a decision a little while ago that the, the intention from the outset was that this was going to be dp872 which is the bolton paul built barracuda which had crashed into a well it's often described as a peat bog it actually wasn't a peat bog it was uh you know kind of the shore of a boggy area at the shore of a lake and um, that, that, that it would be as original to DP-872 as possible. as possible, And uh, they use as much of DP-872. And obviously this kind of, it creates its own problems um, because if you've got kind of, if you've got kind of a, you know, battered, you know, terribly corroded piece from DP-872, uh, you know, it takes some work to, to get that back to a, a usable condition whereas you might have a much better example from a different barracuda wreck or you might be able to fabricate something from new and i know there was an ex- a couple of examples where they'd, they'd had some tubes fabricated because they're you know you can't get that spec commercially anymore and then they got this wreck up from the solent and that had examples of original ones on so it was like well mm, yes yeah, we've got these nice new ones but we want this to be as original as possible so we will work on the original fabric. So I think they've made a decision that it will be more of that it will be more of a kind of slightly more of a generic rebuild than the very very specific restoration of DP eight seven two. But that said, they are still have the the intention to make it as original as as reasonably possible within the um, the sort of time and resources that they have available. And I think you know the, the stuff they've done already is is remarkable on that. But I think there's, they've got slightly more focus now on okay, we need to we need to get a barracuda out of this rather than just lots of really cool components. But, you know, it, it's, it's, they're doing such a fantastic job on it. And it's, you know, when you go to the museum, go to the Fleet Air Arm Museum, they're there and you can go and see them working on it uh, at certain days of the week. So, uh, you know, I recommend, uh, recommend doing that as well as following them on, on Facebook, but it's, 
all this stuff that you see when they're doing a restoration, you won't see when the aircraft is finished. Um, so, you know, it's worth kind of following this to sort of the, the you know, I'm learning, I've, I've written a book on the Barracuda and I've learned so much stuff about the, the internal structures and systems that I just didn't get into when writing the book. So, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, that one's awesome. Great. I've just been having beers with Tony Hoskins about AA810. So that's, that's the one that's sort of on, on my mind. And that's, um, yes, keep, keep, keep an eye out on Tony's various feeds for that because there's lots of cool news coming up for that one which of course being a great escape pilot in it and we might even mention one of her 810's other pilots a bit later when we talk about racing pilots but let's crack on because we've got some movies coming up this summer as well there's the big one which frankly i'm stupidly excited for which has got nothing to do with second world war well it does actually it's top gun 2 which Apparently, it's just incredible. Now, the reason I actually really want to see it is I want to figure out how they work in a a naval aviator on naval aviators pay guessing a Mustang. And why would a naval aviator have an Air Force fighter and not a you know, Hellcat? Or okay, I said, that's got to be a pull up point they sort, sort out for me. Mm. But, but of course, it's 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 tom's mustang so he's going to get it in for tax purposes isn't he am i alone in being like stupidly excited about this or are you guys kind of keen yeah i'm looking i'm looking forward to it top the original top gun for me is is uh, if it's on watch it type film and there's not many that i can say that about forrest gump being another and uh because of my age ghostbusters being uh being another which is slightly different themes but top gun is a uh, yeah if, if it's on watch it i'm a huge huge fan of the f-14 so it's a little bit gutting that obviously the new one, we're moving to a, a different aircraft altogether. One that I must admit, I've never, I've never really been too enamoured with. It's not quite hit me the same way that the Tomcat did when the when the original Top Gun came out. But that said, having seen what I've seen, some of the flying scenes in it look absolutely mind blowing. I've been told that it's going to be better than the original. It's it's got to go some way to being better than the original. But if if if, if it is, then great. So yes, uh, you know, no, you're not alone. I am very much looking forward to seeing it. Yeah, me too. Um, and I think also, also, I'm a big Hornet fan, uh, and you know, uh, because you know, I'm a weirdo and a contrarian. I'm more of a Hornet fan than a uh, Tomcat fan. And thank um, you very much for joining us, Matt. It's always a pleasure to have you on the show. <laughs> <laughs> Oh God, you are not going to like what I have to say about the Tomcat in the uh, the Hush Kit podcast, but we won't talk about that. Anyway, um, <laughs> I'm basically going to torpedo my entire career with that podcast. So you know, um, I'll, I, well, it, it's yeah, it's, I'll, it's I'll, Joe. You won't be the the first, and you won't be the last to, to torpedo no, a career no. on Hush Kit. Will you? <laughs> <laughs> Taken me this time to to build it up again after the last time. And anyway, yeah, no, and and just yeah, like you say, like you say, Adam, the 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 in the, the in flight stuff, the air to air stuff just looks phenomenal. And uh, you know, I'm I'm a being a kind of a cinephile and uh, a VFX fan, and also a real kind of you know, I love physical VFX, uh, you know, special effects done for real physical you know, physical stuff. Actually, you're know, doing real things with real aeroplanes, and it just looks like you know, even if the story's crap, the characters you can't engage with, what have you, even you know, any any of that, it'll just be worth watching. So yeah, I will have to try and I, I will no doubt watch it several times with different hats on, and probably try and see it several times on as big a screen as possible. To be honest, yeah, I'm 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 hoping to go with one of our down the pub Jess guest judges Simon London to, to see it on the, the IMAX at Waterloo because I think as, as as big a screen as you can even if it you know don't don't wait for it on your telly folks get out and mm. get out and see it on something on something big the other thing that I think will look really good on the big screen is the Lancaster documentary which has been another yep. thing that's been a long time coming personally I'm not sure I had real uh, I'm get, of course I'm going to say this I had real problems with the Spitfire one I thought it was a little bit too misty eyed for what it could be. But from some of the clips, especially with the, um, there's um, Elsa, the German lady that they've got talking about the experience of, of being a civilian in Germany during a raid. I think they've, it looks more 
I don't, I don't want to say rounded. I haven't seen it yet. I've just seen the trailers. But I, I think I think there's just from that, it seems that they've taken a little bit more of a 360 view, which which I'm looking forward to. It looks fantastic. So I think that's. I, ha- I actually haven't seen the Spitfire one largely because just so much about the Spitfire lacks nuance. And I just got the impression from the trailers that it was just going to be pretty much the sort of same, you know, it's, it's got to the point where it's, it's about the legend rather than about the reality. And it's interesting you hear to, to hear you say that the, the Lancaster one, it sounds like they haven't done that so much. I mean, it's not quite the aircraft doesn't quite have the same sort of mythos or it, does have quite a big one but it, you know it's i think because of the nature of what it is and what it did it's 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 a little bit harder to mythologize in quite the same way so uh, so that sounds interesting and, and some of the just just the again the the aerial footage that they've that they've got from it and uh, uh, and so on just looks just gorgeous so um you know, yeah i mean be- in the in the, uh, in the trailer there's a scene of the uh, the BBMF lank taking off towards camera, and uh, I've always been of the opinion that uh, that the the frontal view of a Lancaster is is when it looks most awesome. You know, it just mm. looks like a it's it's the best view, and I think that that scene alone is uh, is worth watching. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll uh, obviously I'll I'll watch it if it's about a Lancaster, I'll watch it. Um, but yeah, hopefully it'll be pretty good. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I'm 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 with you, Matt. That there's the nature of the aircraft leads to needing to tell a more nuanced story. Whereas the, the, the Spitfire is the Spitfire. To, to be fair, the Spitfire doc is basically the documentary that they made if you'd only ever seen First of the Few. Right. Yeah, the, the, they, 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 draw, they draw that line and it's very sort of stirring scores. And yeah, and Jeff Wellham, you can't, you can't watch Jeff without smiling because yeah, mm, mm, Jeff. True, yeah. true. Yeah. But it's um yeah it does does what you expect it to do. Now I did send you the link to a trailer which I found the other day for a very I've just called it odd Spitfire movie in our notes because it's it's done by the guys that did Lancaster Skies which again wasn't great but for the budget that they had was quite quite impressive for what they've done so they've done the same sort of thing again with a a PRU Spitfire mm. and. I, I sent it just for the pink. I also sent it to, to, to Tony Hoskins and, and he just went, yeah, I've been watching that because um, it's literally his his bag. But I was just wondering, we're just talking about trailers here, folks. So if you're bored, you know, come back in a couple of minutes. I like what this team is doing on a teeny tiny budget. Granted, I think they should spend more time on the script based on the trailer. But I was wanting to get your sort of feelings for the these little passion projects, which you know, the, the internet and, and, and these things get, allow us. What are sort of your feelings for, for something like that? I wanted to like this. I, don't, I mean, and I will watch the film. I'd say I wanted to like Lancaster Skies, but I couldn't, I couldn't finish watching it. I probably should have. I didn't get to the point. I presume they go flying in a Lancaster at some point and do some operations. I didn't actually get that far. But, you know, talking about the passion projects, the, the one I would really want to flag up is the Lano Hawker film which is, uh, you know, it's being made with David Bremner, his, his Bristol Scout. They've done some great, they've, you know, they've got a mock-up Bristol Scout that they've got on a gimbal and use that for filming. And some of the stuff that, you know, there are, there are clips around that actually look really good and the quality looks amazing and some good model work as well. So I would, I would kind of encourage people to, to seek that one out. A uh, bit of First World War air combat. Yeah, I don't know if that's the finished... Um, CGI that's on the Spitfire film because it it looked a little unfinished to me just on the on the small screen so I don't know how it's going to look in in the real thing but as, as someone who does Second World War fiction as well as the non-fiction stuff it, it's you know I, I I do want more stuff more stuff like this I like it to be done really well and I just have sl- well you know I don't I don't want to slag it off before the films come out I'll keep an eye on it and you know and some of the some of the stuff they've got, like the, the Spitfire cockpit and the the clothing and stuff like that, looks 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 done well. So um, fingers crossed. It, it's called um, Spitfire over Berlin, by the way. We've, it's it's not called Odd Spitfire movie. So don't don't <laughs> go googling that. You'll find something very strange. Sorry, Adam. I was gonna no. I was gonna say I think that they're um, I, I think that they're more regardless of well. 
you can live with some of the quality if there's there's the right sort of passion there um, and a willingness from the people who made it to, you know, really delve deep into researching whatever it is that they're they're theming it on, um, you know, and it looks like these guys have done have done a reasonable job with that from what you know you can see in the trailer. Um, a friend of mine sent me a link a week or so ago to a, um, a film it's slightly off topic, but it's about the, the second range of Italian landing at uh, Point de Hoc in, um, in Normandy on D-Day. And uh, it is mind-blowingly atrocious. It's, um, it's borderline mm. comedy, you know, kit-wise, e- everything you can think of wise. It's, and evidently something like that is created with the, the frame of mind that somebody just decided that they wanted to, you know, they might make other genre, genres of film, but they might have decided they wanted to make a war film. Whereas with, you know, with some of these, like you say, passion projects, you can tell that there is some real passion for what they're doing there. And, uh, and some, some actual effort has gone into researching them and making sure that everything they do kit wise and, you know, dialogue wise is, is, is pretty accurate. Because, you know, dialogue's a huge thing in these things. You know, people, you know, it sounds like a weird thing to say. People talk differently to how we do now. An, ex- an example I was told the other day, which is, again, going slightly off topic, was during the filming of Masters of the Air, which, of course, is something else that hopefully we may see this year. I think the plan is to see it this year. They were using a Vietnam-era way of referring to lieutenants on set, a way which was never used during the Second World War. And... Uh, it was picked up by a historical advisor and uh, the producer or the director who was filming the scenes in which this dialogue was used had an entire day's worth of shots reshot using the correct dialogue, which is what you want to hear on something like this because, you know, these things, these little details make all the difference really at the end of the day. So, yeah, if, if people are willing to put that time in and, you know, really, really do their research, then they can be you know, you can kind of look beyond the the quality or, you know, any of the sort of CGI on there. Mm. No, that's fair, actually. And also, I think the one thing I did want to say was the fact that it's a photo reconnaissance spitfire and the story is based around photo reconnaissance rather than um, rather than air combat is actually, you know, uh, definite points for them for um, for doing that part of the story and telling something that's sort, sort of, yeah, t- it's a spitfire, but it's, mm. it's not your average spitfire. And uh, I would say, you know, th- things like, I think what, what, what put me off slightly about Lancaster skies was, you know, things like the, you know, having WAFs just wandering around the men's accommodation on an RAS station and things like that in 1942 and understand why they would do it for the narrative. But, um, you know, things like that, you just, just look at it and it's hard to suspend disbelief with things like that. There are other much bigger productions that have done worse. So um, it, it is what it is. Yeah. I, I think masses of the sky is, is, is the big one. I, yeah, I'm going to name drop here. I was at an event and I was chatting to John Orloff and he broke out his iPhone and started showing me pictures. And the the two B-17s that they've made are actually, they're taxiable, but they're like big remote control things. Mm. Oh it's, so, it's so cool. <laughs> it's literally like a guy with like a, an airplane remote controller and he's just driving the, the B-17s around on it with yeah. these big electric motors on the wheels. It's, um, but then you, you sort of start zooming into what, detail they put on to the static aircraft and then the um the, the whole cockpit that they can sort of expand out sections of to put cameras it looks incredible which you would kind of expect from the insane amounts of money mm. apple paying on it yeah i mean I'm, I'm lucky enough to know a few people that have worked on the on on behind the scenes on there as historical advisors and I had a conversation on the phone with one three or four weeks ago and i voiced a concern that it would be maybe a little bit like Band of Brothers and sort of play with the history a little bit because there were rumours around about certain things they were trying to do which wouldn't be historically, you know, accurate for it. And I essentially sort of said to him, you know, ease my mind a bit, tell me that it's it's going to be good. And um, and he said, he said, you know, it is going to be very, very good. And this guy knows his stuff. And he's, uh, I'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying so, very hard to please when it comes to the sort of historical accuracy in films. So for him to say that, it's, uh, you know, it's a bit more reassuring. And like, you know, like you, Matt, we've, I've seen some incredible photos of some of the set dressing and, as you say, the, 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 
the mock-up B-17s. And also, if you take a look at aerial photographs of the area around the tower at the real Thorpe Abbots, the detail they've gone into in placement of the buildings and everything around the tower for it, it's, you know, it's exactly, exactly right, which they don't often do on, on, on things like this, because I, I suppose they don't really think it matters. I, don't, I wouldn't want to say it again on here, but having heard what the rumoured spend has been, it's absolutely, you know, it boggles the mind, the amount of money that's been spent on it. So hopefully it'll be worth it. Yep. It, it looks, it looks something. I was going to say, have we seen the the production that uh, Shoot Aviation was was working on with their Bouchons and and Messerschmitt 108s in desert camouflage? Because I'm whatever the hell that was, I'm really really interested to see it. That yeah. that might be the SAS thing. That the that's what I heard. Yeah. yeah, that's what I yeah. heard. And I believe that's out now. Has it started? Rogue oh, SAS oh, yeah. is called, isn't it? I think. Uh, um, yeah. Rogue Some of the lines off. Yeah, I'll keep an eye out for that then. Rogue Warriors, isn't it? That's, that's, it. that's the one. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's have a. This is this is great radio, folks. All of us googling when this thing's out. Um... <laughs> Sorry, I should, I should have all these things that I should have thought of before. Um... It's. Well, yeah. it, I, I, I don't think. I don't think. It, I don't think it is out yet. Um... Anyways, it's it's soon, but it's yeah, but yeah. it's the, the Ben McIntyre Empire rolling on with yeah, Operation Mince Meet in the Cinemas, which I haven't seen, and from what I've heard, I don't need to see. Um uh, oh dear. And, and, I haven't actually read any reviews or, or seen any opinions on that film yet. Um but it doesn't sound positive. <laughs> I've, I've got I've got the book. The book was good. Yeah, I read it on a flight. It's 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 not not particularly um, hard going. Um, honestly, I'll just sort of uh, say at this point that if anyone wants to make a um, an adaptation of my Malta trilogy, then you know I don't care if you ruin it; just make it. You know, yeah. Um, <laughs> that, make you, make that's, you lots of money. Yes. Well, you know, I don't even care about that either. I just want to see it on the screen. Mm. I, I yeah, here you go. One one of one of my favourite Second World War based movies is is Malta's story. I, I, yeah. I think, yeah. I think, it's the most un un Guinness Alec Guinness performance ever because he's he's so restrained. But it just it's it's fab. Anyways, we 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 must move on. Books? Anything got you? You both have stuff coming up. But are you looking forward to actually reading anything that's for pleasure? I would like to read something for pleasure, but this podcast means I have a stack of books I need to read to to talk to good people like yourself. Same, really. Yeah, I'm I'm not I. Uh... Yeah, I would love to read something for pleasure. I can't remember the last time I did, to be honest with you. I'm probably going to pick up, just because of my love for all things US Airborne, I'm probably going to pick up the book about Ron Spears, because judging by um, the interview with the authors that, uh, that our friend Paul Woodage did on his uh, World War II TV, it sounds like it's, gonna, it's, gonna, it's quite um, revealing in terms of some of the stories that were made famous through Band of Brothers and his portrayal in Band of Brothers. So... But for me, that will be a, you know, hopefully that'll just be a, you know, an easy reader. That'll just be um, something like you say that I read for my enjoyment more than anything. I, like like you guys, I've not read anything. The, the amount of books, I'm sure it's the same with you guys. The amount of books I've got on shelves that are half read with post-it notes hanging out of them is alarming. And my wife is often saying to me, "How many of these books have you actually read?" And it's it's most of them, but define what you mean by reading. Do you mean having read the whole thing, or you know, read a couple of pages? Mm. Um, you know, so, but yeah, I, I, that's the only one really at the moment that I'm, I'm contemplating um, buying a copy of. I, I actually read something for fun the other month. I went back and reread uh, Goodbye Mickey Mouse. Oh, such a good book. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I, I must have been a teenager when I read it last time and it, superb, superb book. Yeah, um, you, you, lo you lost on me, me with that one. Right, uh, Len Dighton about a a, a group of um, P fifty one pilots. All oh, right, okay. It, oh, well, after, it, I'll have to have a look at look at. It, it's it's not a hard read at all. Um, yeah, you'll polish it off quite quickly. But it, it's. Um, I, 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 I tell a lie. There is another book that that's not new, but I do want to get a hold of, and that's uh, Richard uh, Trigaskis, the book he wrote about uh, Guadalcanal, because uh, apparently the way that he writes this 
is a great portrayal of the horrors of the sort of combat that the Marines faced on um, on Guadalcanal. Again, it's not aviation themed, but it's um, it, it, it sounds naive of me, but I didn't know. Although I knew he was there, I thought he was there, you know, as a reporter, and that he was, you know, sending snippets back to be published in newspapers or magazines or whatever. I didn't actually know he'd written a book. Uh, until about two weeks ago. So I thought to myself, well, that sounds like a good read. So um, that's another one that I'm going to try and uh, try and get a copy of. I'm assuming given the, the magnitude of, of the name that it will still be available, hopefully. My B25 kick at the moment, I've just, it's never been published here, but Tom uh, McKee, McKee Cleaver wrote a book about the wing that Joe Heller was in called Bridge Busters, all about tactical Mitchells so I'm, I'm trying to find a copy of that that isn't an absolute fortune then has to come from America yeah um, but it's not due out until October and the nice right. Osprey don't have any so there we go but anyways, that, that's it yeah, ladies and gentlemen there will be a loss of shows coming up about B25 Mitchells in the <laughs> uh, in, in a little while sorry Matt you're gonna say something while we're on the subject of books I can kind of shoehorn it in which is another another screen adaptation I'm looking forward to which I forgot to mention before is The Shepherd the adaptation of the Frederick Forsyth novella which I think John Travolta was financing and uh, and directing I think but so you know DH Vampire it's a beautiful book and the, the I don't know the, the certainly the early editions were were kind of really beautifully illustrated with with pencil drawings as well I imagine it'll just be a shortish film because it's only a it's only a short book but um, uh, there was a radio adaptation of it a few years ago that was on BBC and they, you know it was a Christmas Eve thing and it's uh, it's apparently like just a passion project for John Travolta because obviously being a pilot himself but um, he, he loves the book apparently so uh, they were doing some filming of that I can't remember where recently somewhere in the UK with an actual vampire so um, yeah um, it's um, fingers I just crossed looked it's it good up. it was in Suffolk and he was in a Weatherspoons so oh, that, that, well, there we go. So he was well, rocking the spoons, the, people. The authentic, uh, the authentic British, British experience. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so we we want to shoehorn a just quick chat about Formula One, but we we started talking about racing pilots in our little group chat earlier, and I ended up in massive rabbit holes. But just to just to give a shout out to to some some great racing pilots that we we were talking about earlier. Who who wants to? to give people a rabbit hole to go down because I've got mine, which I'm going to save to the end. Oh, well, I'll jump in with, um, with Chris Staniland, who was a um, ferry test pilot uh, before the war in the 1930s. He was, actually, he was actually killed in a firefly during the Second World War. Um, but he was... Uh, that he was had a, really... a structural failure. I'll just throw that in. It wasn't just hawker oh, <laughs> that structural failures, people. <laughs> yeah, but uh, he was a failure of the aircraft. It wasn't a piloting error yeah he was he was a really accomplished uh, racing driver as well it was kind of old school stuff he was uh, mainly racing at Brooklyn uh, so he wasn't particularly sort of on the international circuit but um, he had a car which it started out as a Grand Prix Alfa Romeo and being kind of a skilled engineer as well as as well as a driver kind of updated it and uh, and modified it sort of out of all recognition from the original Alfa, Alfa Romeo it was known sort of half jokingly as the multi-union because bits and pieces of various cars had gone into it. And obviously it was a kind of play on auto union, which were around at the time. And it did look rather like a Grand Prix Mercedes by the time he finished with it. Uh, and he sort of set, um, set various lap records. I think he set an absolute outer circuit record in it before it was broken by, uh, by John Cobb. He certainly set class records. And the, the other fairy test pilot, Duncan Mingus, who I wrote a biography of several years ago, who sort of, he drove with Staniland once um, in his Bentley um, and uh, Staniland drove him from one, you know, it's like they were going from one aerodrome to another. And um, he was driving this thing like he was um, like he was on the, the the race circuit. And Mingus basically wrote in a letter that you know he'd he'd once he'd been driven by Stanley and once he refused to go with him again, um, not because he wasn't an excellent driver, which you know he, Mingus is at pains to point out that you know he was a really really good driver, but it was that he made no allowances for other road users not being of the same quality as he was. So. Um, <laughs> Reading between the lines, I think Mingus was scared after death. He was kind of this kind of typical daredevil in the way he did everything, but he was a really kind of precise 
display pilot and Mingus was a, an, an awesome display pilot you know he's a really good aerobatic pilot himself but he, he you know he was first to admit that, um, that, that that he wasn't even on Stanlin's level as a presentation pilot and I think those skills were the same skills that I think what we would call car control now um, Stanlin had just that total precision yeah so I think it's, it's sort of you know his, his career as a racing driver is not terribly well known sadly his car which survived survived the war and it was in kind of pretty complete condition I think the engine had blown but apart from that you know the, the, this kind of unique car that had been built by this sort of um, important figure in British aviation and motor racing but because it contained by now the only two but it contained part of the chassis rails of an, of, of an Al, original Alfa Romeo, which had Grand Prix history, someone took it and basically junked all the stuff that, was, that, 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 that had been added to it over the years, took the chassis rails and uh, restored uh, a Grand Prix Alfa Romeo. So now we've got this, this kind of these two chassis rails parading around, pre presenting as an original pre-war Alfa Romeo, which they probably claim had Nuvolari history and things like that, but probably didn't. So his car kind of still exists and apparently the sort of like the, the multi-union bodywork is still in a garage somewhere but you know you know i better stop there because otherwise i'm just going to rant about uh, restorations <laughs> but um <laughs> yeah that's so chris Stanland, who you that aspect of him you may not have heard of was well, it ken i've got ken ellis's test pilot books and the final entry for Stanlin was the irrepressible Stanlin, the 37 year old died as he'd lived in the fast lane there you go <laughs> yeah and, and to be honest I've, I've heard some stuff about, about Stan, some other stuff about Stanlin which which I'm not allowed to publish. Anyone for you Adam or shall I just... Oh well, obviously I was reminded earlier of uh, Tony Gaze, the Australian um, Spitfire pilot at Fighter Race, who was in F1 and Le Mans, but to be honest with you, you know don't know a great deal about his uh, his wartime experiences, but it, you know, if Wikipedia is to be believed, had thirteen and a half kills to his name. So he seems to be a um, seems he was a pretty accomplished fighter pilot. But one one in fact I came across early, which I didn't know, and I'm, I'm I'm wondering whether or not either of you two know this. But do you know who owned the Indianapolis Motor Speedway during World War Two? During in World War Two, interesting. Ooh. No, I don't. It was owned during World War II by Eddie Rickenbacker. Uh, really? Yeah, he bought it after, obviously, after World War I. And uh, he made the decision, apparently, to, to cease racing there during, during the war because, obviously, there, there was a greater need for the materials that went into the cars and, obviously, the fuel that went into the cars towards the war effort. So there was no racing at the IMS during the, uh, during the war. But, yes, it was, it was owned by Rickenbacker. At the time, wow, yeah. Mm. So he, I mean, you know, you, you make the assumption that he obviously had some sort of uh, passion for motor racing. Otherwise, mm. he wouldn't have bought one of the most famous racetracks on the planet, would he? Yeah. And wasn't he quite big on the board speedways? Possibly before before the First World War, even. It, um, yeah, mate. Yeah, yeah. Believe so. Mm. Um, yeah, um, it was interesting. Interesting little factoid. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. It's kind of, it kind of reminds me of, you know, The Wings, the 1927 film about the, you know, World War I combat. But before they go off to France, they're uh, building, a, building a special based on a Ford or something like that, presumably, and, uh, you know, early automotive history. So, no, uh, cool. Because um, yeah, for, for me, the, the ones that sort of popped into, into my head were AFP Fame, very well-known pre-war racer, photo recon pilot, flew... Tony's A8 810 and crashed trying to get back to, to Duxford and he in fog at low level and he flew down the wrong railway line and, and hit a hedge, which in fog when he should have been going off to photograph the um, uh, subpens at Wilhelmshaven. Um, but anyways, that's that. But the, the, one, the one I did want to mention, which is remarkable in so many different ways is Roberta Cowell. So Roberta was the first male to female transgender person in the UK, but before she transitioned, she was a racing driver, raced at Brooklyn's quite a bit and was a fighter recon pilot 
four squadron. So it was with Jumbo Mujumar, all of those guys. And she was shot down in EK-49, one of the um, Typhoon FR aircraft in 19... I should, I should have it here. Do, do, do. 18th of November, 1944, and ended up in Staff, Stalag Luft 1 for, for the duration. So utterly amazing life. Definitely look it up. I, I, I did immediately start looking to see if I could get her autobiography, but it's thousands of pounds. It was a small, small mm-hmm. edition run. But very, very interesting. Um, lots of articles um, about her life and the interesting situation she found herself in in the prison camp. But definitely wow. look at look her up and yeah. Fane as well he had, he, had, he he was a bit of a bo- he was a bit of a boy but there will be more about him as well later but now we're all together we got it we got to do this um we're leaving <laughs> the set the only the only link to the second world war is that you know adam and i were roasting next to an ex bomber base <laughs> yeah. with a yeah. with a red with a red bull racing employee shouting the c word at Lewis oh Hamilton. yeah so <laughs> oh yeah what a day that yeah for yeah. for context people we met up at the british grand prix last year and um sebastian vettel sebastian vettel uh, we'll get we'll get on to him in a minute uh, max verstappen threw himself at lewis hamilton one corner before where we were sitting so if he mm. had the good grace to wait until chapel beckett's and, and all that we would have had it right in front of us but yeah abu dhabi what do you think go <laughs> Yeah, I've got to be careful what I say here because, as you know, Matt, I am a big Lewis Hamilton fan. A complete farce, broken rules, you know, whatever you want to pluck out of the air of, of everything that, that feels wrong about the sport at the moment sort of culminated in, in this event, I believe. There was things leading up to it, I suppose, that, that felt very much like the FIA weren't in control necessarily of certain situations in the season. A certain Mr. Massey looked like he'd lost control of a number of races that season, uh, last season. But, you know, who knew that he was going to come up with what he came up with on the um, on the final day. Bullied, I think, is the right word by team principals. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not naive enough to say that, you know, that doesn't involve those at the, uh, at the Mercedes garage. But certainly on that final day, he made a glaring error that essentially... Um, but essentially won Max Verstappen his championship, in, in my opinion. And people, you know, people will bring up, and I saw, I saw a video online earlier again, again, people still talk about it all the time, that Max Verstappen led more races and that he, you know, he won more races and this, that and the other. And unfortunately, that's not how sport works. At the end of the day, whoever's got the most points wins the championship. And up until the final lap of that race, Lewis Hamilton had the most points. And until Mr. Massey came along with his um, odd ruling for that final lap, the, the championship was Lewis Hamilton's. And that is how sport works. You can't, you know, you don't win sport on statistics. You know, you win it on the important things. And, and Lewis Hamilton had done what he needed to do that day, I believe, to win the title. I believe the last four races of that season were, were Lewis at his very best. He was at his very best on in that race as well. Um, he was putting in excellent lap times on very old tyres. But unfortunately, you know, somebody expected him to uh, fight off, uh, you know, fight off Max on the same tyres whilst Max had brand new shoes on. So it's, uh, yeah, fast is probably the right word in, in my mind. I Yeah, I agree. Um, and I think it's, yes, the race itself was a farce, but then the, the, the subsequent cover-up and attempts to justify it were worse because I think it's if someone screws up and if someone screws up that badly you know who hasn't screwed up I've made some horrendous mistakes in my life I'm sure we all have but you know the mark of kind of the 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 test that that applies to us is to is to admit to it and try and put it right and Mm. I know with the FIA as far as the FIA and Formula One were concerned there was no doubt an awful lot of money and other stuff and it would have opened one hell of a can of worms if they had afterwards said yeah we screwed this up it was it should have happened in the way it did but we're going to try and put it right and what trying to put it right would have looked like I have no idea and we'd probably still be in court now if that had happened but I think 
you know, even for Massey on an individual level to come out, or now he's not in that job anymore, what's stopping Massey saying, actually, you know, the pressure got to me, I shouldn't have done, well, having said that, I suppose if he's, if he says that, then, you know, he opens up the, the FIA to, uh, to, to legal challenges and all that kind of stuff, and this is probably where it gets more complicated, but I just, I just think it was, that's the thing that really hurt for me, was not, yeah, I mean, it was, I was screaming at the screen, and, and it was a, it was a nonsensical application of, of the rules and quite why he thought he had the authority to do what he did at the time mm. um, to kind of take one thing that he could authorise and but only partially. And yeah, anyway, it was just... Um, well, there were signs that, um, that, you know, that he had the potential to to maybe make that sort of decision. Obviously, the, the, the Grand Prix previous at Jeddah, mm, you know, yeah. tried to make the deal with Red Bull, you know, and it's, oh, you, know, yeah. you know, there's either a rule or there's not, you know, you don't make deals yeah. with your teams, you know, so it's, um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, like you say. Yeah, and I, and I think obviously you've got, then you sort of go back to the, the whatever deal was cooked up with Ferrari over their engines and things like that and it's it's like and then you but and the whole the way the whole way formula one is set up now with the the strategy group which involves the teams and i think maybe it's maybe we need a, a situation in which the teams are the organizations that participate in the sport and the rule makers are the people who set the rules and you know formula one is the body that organizes it and there is there are sort of actual delineations between those organizations and you know everything's written in concrete terms that everyone understands and and there can be no confusion but you know it's as I think it was Frank Williams that said it's uh it's a business all times apart from two hours every other Sunday I don't want to be conspiracist about it and and I don't think there was a conspiracy as such but I think there was a lot of pressure for there to be a different winner than uh, Lewis Hamilton yeah. And one of the things that I've said really since Max has been in the sport is that they, they go easy on him because he's box office. And Max drives in a way that I don't think should be allowed. And he's been allowed to get away with driving in that way. And he's been enabled in that by, both by his team and by the, the governing bodies because he has a big fan base, because there are a lot of people excited by him, because he's... You know, he has helped bring new audiences into Formula One and things like that. And I think we've got to the point now where we have because people have turned a blind eye to the way that he drives. And um, it, it's that more than anything else that sort of put me off Formula One. You know, I still watch it. I still follow it. But I don't have the same enthusiasm I did over it even a couple of years ago, really. Yeah. I mean, I'm finding it very difficult to get infused over new cars, to be honest with you. Yeah. I mean, it looked very clumsy on the track. You know, it, it's evident that, you know, a certain few teams have applied the new regs pretty well. Other teams haven't. I don't really think it's made the racing any different to what it was before. Personally, you're still looking at, at cars only really making overtakes in DRS zones, for example, and you know, it's not, there's not a great deal. You know, we, we were, they made it sound like it was going to become like a touring car, basically. And it's, it hasn't really, has it? And, and to be honest with you, I, would, I wouldn't sooner watch a touring car race. You know, but it's almost illegal in a touring car race not to pull in at the end of the race wearing somebody else's paintwork. You know, and that's, that's what racing should be in my mind. As long as it's within, you know, the parameters of, uh, you know, what is safe and what, what the regulations are, then. You know, it makes for great racing. But, you know, I find it funny you made a comment about, you know, the, the application of regulations and, you know, how seriously the FIA take them. And, and at the moment, they're, they're taking regulations over wearing the right sort of pants and not wearing jewellery in the car. Oh, my God. You know, yeah. very, very seriously. But, but, but apparently, it'd be, you know, when it comes to actual regulations during a race, they can be flexible with those, which I, I find very contradictory. It's yeah, I mean, the new cars, I think I was quite excited about those sort of when they were introduced. And I think, you know, the bringing more ground effects in and I actually think Ross Braun had had a decent approach. I was, you know, pleased when he took over the sort of technical side of it. And there was a talk that he did here at, um, at Southampton Uni just before he took on that role where he was talking about his approach as a team boss or as a, you know, as a technical, as a technical boss for a team and how he would apply because, you know, I think it was, 
at the time it was a sort of a fairly open secret that he was um, he was certainly in the running for that role. So he was talking about how he would act, you know, what he would do if he was given that role. You know, and and it's very much more systematic than than things had been. And we had those really ridiculous 2017 regulations where I think it was, you know, tail end of Bernie era and he decided the cars aren't fast enough. They need to be faster and not actually pay any attention to the racing whatsoever. So they just bolted more downforce on them mm. uh, and given them bigger tires. And, and I think it's, it's, you know, we have to go back to the fact that actually the racing was quite considerably better in, in sort of, you know, 20 up to 2016. Um, yeah. And people complained about the overtaking then, but, you know, it got significantly worse when they, they brought in those, the wider cars and the, the bigger wings and, and, and all that stuff. And then you actually, the, really the whole time I've been interested in Formula One, going back to the 80s, people have been complaining about not enough overtaking. And I think maybe people kind of needed to calm down at times because it's just... It sort of feels like everything they've done has made it worse ever since. You know, certainly I remember the regulations back in in 89 were supposed to to improve the racing over 88. I suppose, you know, you had the situation in 88 where it was McLaren dominated everything and it wasn't like it wasn't an exciting season. The cars are too big and hit too heavy. Uh, I don't think you'd struggle to find anyone who disagreed with that, um, that, that viewpoint. And it's just, uh, but having said that, I remember the Indy cars, the sort of the, the, the Indy cars of the mid nineties, they were big, heavy cars and yet they managed to race well on street circuits. Mm. So they need to make the car smaller and lighter. They need to be more nimble. You know, a, a racing car, the, the ultimate racing car, which Formula One is kind of supposed to be, it doesn't necessarily have to be the fastest. They've always been faster series than Formula One, but it kind of feels like it has to be the ultimate in, in when you take everything in the round. And it feels like they should be more nimble, more agile, cars that you can kind of race with and, and these kind of big lumbering things. And also it just sort of shows that the fact that they've, the tyres again it's always seems to be the tyres seem to be the um the limiting factor like in Miami it was like yeah it's great on the racing line but we've kind of spent millions and millions on these new aerodynamic regulations that make the cars easier to follow each other but then you give them only one racing line you can't move off that racing line no matter what the aerodynamics are doing so it's like come on (laughs) these people are supposed to be clever yeah I, I yeah. think I think my 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 biggest gripe with the new regs is they bottled it slightly on the ground effects. If you're going to allow ground effects, curved undersides, go whole hog, put the skirts on them, and then st- strip off the arrow on the to- on the top. Mm. You know, it's it. Th- there was always going to be as soon as they had open sided bottoms to it sound, I'm getting rude now. Open sided bottoms, porpoising was going to happen. It was going to hit somebody badly, and it was going to hit someone else less. And I was sitting all here as Lewis fans, but yeah, you know, it. I, th- I think as soon as they announced that, it was like, well, that's not really going to do enough. And I just think it's cars look cool. It's nice to see that they all look quite different to a degree. Um, I think the Ferrari looks really cool, actually. But mm. and it's nice to see them winning. I really wish Carlos would figure out how to keep it out of the wall. Um, mm. Yeah. But, um, you know, it, it, it's, it is really interesting. But we just to wrap up, we, we were talking about something earlier. It's been cropping up more recently with, with Seb's struggles is this Red Bull's greatest racer. It's obviously Sebastian Vettel. Mm. But uh, have we reached this point that we are so enamored with, say, the, the immediacy of things like Drive to Survive, social media which is immediate that we are forgetting just how good you know seven was forgetting you know we think of lewis and his seven titles eight with a star next to them and we forget the years that he battled seven the Freud was it uh 2017 2018 granted Freud had a trick engine but we won't get into that but he was incredible why is it Am I thinking right that we our memories have gotten so short for the the, the general fan oh. base, or is or is it something else? There, oh. there is always a recency bias, always a recency bias. When I worked at Autosport and it was during the Schumacher era, and it was just at the beginning of his Ferrari dominance, so many people back then 
considered Schumacher to be like absolutely unquestionably the greatest of all time. And I completely disagreed with that then. And I disagree with it now. But now if you look at the sort of lists of, you know, people talk about Hamilton a lot and people starting to talk about Max as the greatest ever, which is a complete joke. If you ask me, utter, utter joke in so many ways. I don't actually even think he's all that good, but anyway, so it's, it's a few, I think there's always this kind of zone that's a few years ago, we're not kind of far enough back to be classic yet, but it's long enough ago that people have kind of forgotten the immediate sense of it. And I think Seb's four titles kind of fall into that zone at the moment. That's my theory. Because I because th- his his mastery of those particular cars, particularly with the blown diffuser, was just unparalleled. I don't think anyone, you know, Hamilton, I think you'd have to say from the hybrid era on was the was the better driver and he has got better and better and better and his mastery of those cars is something to behold but seb in that in that particular era at the you know 2010 to the mid 2010s just nobody could touch him for the way he could drive those cars and get a lap time out of them mm. that's my that's my take anyway yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's an element of, um, of the way that F1 fandoms changed over the last few years because it, it's obviously become a more popular sport. You know, social media means that the, the way that people talk about races and talk about drivers is becoming more like, you know, wh- how football fans talk about teams. A lot of it's very toxic, I find. And it, it makes me sad to think that, that F1 is, is going in that direction. And I feel like there's an awful lot of fans. I'm not being judgmental towards those that are, that are new, that are new to the sport, but I just don't think they've got a great grasp of sort of F1 history. And it goes back to what you said, Matt. But they don't, you know, they probably didn't see Seb race, and they probably don't care enough to to go back and look at actually how good he was. They just see, like you say, who's you know somebody who's popular now or someone who they, they perceive to be better now, but Seb was annoyingly good. I used to really hate him. Mm-hmm. Um, Same. Um, yeah. I, I really like him now because he's mellowed a lot and obviously he's doing great things outside of the sport. I believe he's on, is he on questing time? Is it tonight or is it tomorrow? It's tonight, yeah, I think. Yeah, I think yeah which tonight, I find yeah. weird, but good on him. You know, I think that's great. So I used to hate him, but, you know, it was, it was, it was hatred born out of whether I was willing to admit it or not, the fact that he was just that good. Mm. You know, and there was... You know, I, I did. I did want to see other drivers win, but you know, at the same time, you can't ignore the fact that he was, you know, a seriously, seriously good driver. It was that counterintuitive yeah, I mean, my, my... driving style, wasn't it, of, of keeping his foot on the gas when he really shouldn't have had the, his foot on the gas to to, to keep the the fuser planted? That was just mind blowing. Yeah, I mean, he's 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 such an intelligent driver um, in terms of technically. I think. Uh, and while I don't think he was ever the best wheel-to-wheel racer, he kind of didn't need to be. He, he was sort of in the, that sort of Jim Clark frame of, of being able to race off into the distance and not, uh, not need to do the wheel-to-wheel stuff. But, I mean, I didn't like him at the time because, I mean, I was a bit of a Weber fan, I have to say. I you know, interviewed Weber a few times when I, was, um, when I was on the magazine and before then, and uh, I liked his approach. And uh, he, to me, he was more of a kind of character I could get to like. So it was sort of with his kind of inter-team battle, intra-team battle with, with Seb. And, and I didn't, you know, I thought in some ways, I think Seb's behaviour sometimes crossed a line within the team and Red Bull kind of enabled him in the way that they're doing with Max now. But since then, I think it's lovely to see someone grow up in the sport like that and actually, um, you know, really see their character grow and develop and, and become a kind of really, really good man, I think. Yeah, I just wish he was in a competitive car and, uh, and, and could, could sort of show what, what I believe he's still capable of for sure right sophie's reminding adam that it's getting late no she was uh, she was actually asking me which f1 driver we were talking about oh she, um, she, 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 yeah, she can, so, she can uh, join in let's, let's get i think feet. she was I, I think she was getting very worried that um that matt was talking about max for a second then so i was just i was just reassuring her <laughs> i was just reassuring her that because um because you know as you as you know matt you you experienced the um the, the intense levels of love that my wife has for Lewis Hamilton 
who she would leave me for in a heartbeat for. Yeah, yeah. So she has this. <laughs> she has this. Oh, she, 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 she can be assured that no good word about Max Verstappen will ever pass my lips. <laughs> um, yeah, that's um, that's very much the case in this household. I have to say. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I think out, out of the four of us that were at that race last year, she was the one who was more likely to give that RBR employee a slap for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're planning on sitting in the same place this year, and I'm very much hopeful that that guy won't be there. Yes, that's, 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 a, that's a good spot. We won't say where it is, because, you know... We, yeah, it is a good spot. It, it, yeah. it, it's a good spot. Anyways, gentlemen, this, this has been a real giggle. We've been going on far too long, and who, who, who knows? Maybe we should, maybe we should do, the, do this again, put, put the yeah. aviation world to rights and uh, get things out. So, Adam Berry, Matthew Willis... Thank you so much. And uh, we'll have you back individually for this because we got to do the Duncan, the Duncan chat as well, Matt, haven't we? So mm -hmm. um, anyways, thank you so much. And we'll be back soon. What I have lined up next, I'm not sure. It's probably going to be B25 Mitchell related because yes, living rent free in my head at the moment, folks. So we'll, um, we'll do something like that. But gents, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you.